Hey folks, how are you? Um, gas exchange. Um, we need to realize that there are two different types of gas exchanges that happen in the respiratory system. Uh, one which we call external exchange, which is an exchange between the blood uh, and the air that happens in the lung. And then there is another exchange that uh, takes place at the tissue level, at the capillary level, where there will be exchange uh, and unloading of the oxygen, oxygen there and then loading of the carbon dioxide. So two different patterns that happen. One of them at, is at the lung where you load oxygen and you unload carbon dioxide. And then there is another uh, exchange that happens at the tissue where exactly the opposite would happen. You give up oxygen and you pick up carbon dioxide instead. So, in order for us to continue talking about the exchange of gases, if you remember the laws of diffusion, where we said that the, 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 the first rule of diffusion is uh, that the, the matters uh, will diffuse across a membrane or diffuse from the area of higher concentration to the area of lower concentration. Do you remember that? Well, in gases, we don't use concentrations in gases we measure them by pressure and so an atmospheric pressure which we are living in is a mixture of different gases and that's that's an important concept to um to keep an eye on and in a mixture of gas each of the gases is participating in the pressure Sort of like if you're carrying a bag of grocery and it has milk and grapes and whatnot, and each of those is contributing to the weight you're carrying. Now, the weight of the grocery will be a, col a collective sum of all the individual weights. And if we were to calculate uh, the, the partial pressure or the partial weight of the milk alone, we need to figure out uh, what is the percentage of the milk. If I tell you that the percentage of the milk is 20% of what you're carrying is milk. And by the way, you're carrying 20 pounds. And so if it's 20% milk and 20 pounds is what you're carrying, so the partial weight of the milk is four pounds, right? 20% of 20 pounds is four pounds. That makes sense, right? So pretty much the same thing when it comes to gases. So in the atmosphere, atmospheric pressure is approximately 760 millimeter mercury, the biggest portion of which is nitrogen, right? And it's about 80%. If you multiply 80% by 760, it will give you the partial pressure for nitrogen, which is described as P capital M2, and that will be approximately 600 millimeter mercury. That is the pressure allocated to the nitrogen because the nitrogen is having a percentage approximately 80% of the total pressure, right? Well, it's the same thing with oxygen. So the oxygen is having the, the, the percentage of oxygen, the normal percentage of oxygen in the air is approximately 20%, right? And so if I multiply 20% by the total atmospheric pressure, it will turn out that the partial pressure for oxygen is approximately 160 millimeter mercury. That makes sense? We understand what partial pressure means? Keep an eye on this because everything from now on we will describe as partial pressure. And we will always put it in as capital P N2 and capital P, O2 for oxygen, and CO2 for carbon dioxide, and H2O for uh, vapor, for um, water vapor. And so if it comes to carbon dioxide, and you're wondering, well, if that is almost 80%, and that's 20%, well, where is carbon dioxide? You will see in the next slide that carbon dioxide existence, normal existence, in the atmosphere is not really that much. It's, it's 0.3. Um, the partial pressure of it is 0.3 millimeter mercury. So it doesn't really have much of an existence, but you will see once it gets in the lungs, uh, 
it's a whole different story you know, outside, also inside the blood is a whole different story so we're going to have a look at that in a little bit i'd like you to appreciate those numbers these are kind of an importance not like you need to remember them but i'm going to tell you what the importance of these numbers in a little bit so we have nitrogen and we agree that it's approximately 80 percent in the air and the partial pressure of nitrogen therefore is approximately 600 oxygen about 21 percent and the partial pressure of 760 will be 160 and the carbon dioxide you can see that the approximate percentage is almost insignificant it's 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 negligible and therefore the partial pressure of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere is approximately 0.3 millimeter mercury when it comes to water h2o then the partial pressure is approximately 3.7 and that's again allocated to the percentage of h2o in the air sounds good so the oxygen concentration we need in the air to be is approximately or the partial pressure of oxygen however is approximately 160 we established that but let's take a scenario here if uh, someone is in, a, in an airplane and the pressure drops suddenly because of something and we know that the higher altitude have lower pressure in total so all of a sudden this instead of being 760 and let's just throw an example here it became 500 right and the 500 if the oxygen stays to be 20 percent of the 500 well that then it becomes low it becomes a hundred only millimeter mercury at a low total pressure a 20 percent of lower pressure lower total pressure will become much lower person much lower partial pressure of oxygen even though the percentage didn't change but the partial pressure of oxygen has changed it's the same thing if i tell you 20 percent of everything you're carrying is milk but instead of you being carrying 20 pounds like we said earlier you're only carrying 10 pounds and so now the 20 percent milk became two pounds instead of being four pounds you get it and that's why in these situations we increase the concentration we increase the percentage of oxygen and you see in movies and when you're in an airplane and they tell you if the pressure drops what do they do they drop the oxygen masks why would they drop the oxygen masks to increase the percentage of oxygen that's coming to you therefore the partial pressure for oxygen remains at approximately 160 to sustain your normal functions you get that it's also why in higher altitudes uh, people can have difficulty in breathing and people in higher altitude they can start to have a, a lot of red blood cells polycythemia why is that because we know and we're going to study that together when we get to the kidney functions and when we get also to the endocrine systems and the blood that there is a hormone being secreted by the kidneys and it's called erythropoietin and the erythropoietin will go to your uh, red bone marrow and will start the synthesis of new red blood cells that's why we have polycythemia in higher altitude because we don't get enough oxygen the oxygen percentage is remaining the same but the overall pressure has dropped you get that equation good well, let's have a look here at carbon dioxide well carbon dioxide is really insignificant at that point so even if it multiply it and you will see in a little bit even if you multiply that by several numbers it's not going to change much because it's insignificant to begin with right so these are the pressures inside the atmosphere right and at sea level but of course the water level varies the carbon dioxide level varies if you're in a closed room or you're in an open air um, water level in a very humid florida day uh, you would have much more air and much more water in the air and much more water will become a higher percentage of water in the air and that can affect the oxygen level so sometimes too humid environment 
uh, may not be very good, especially for people who are suffering from respiratory problems to begin with, uh, because the oxygen concentration will drop. Why did the oxygen concentration drop? Well, because the water uh, concentration rose, and that may have an if effect on the percentage of oxygen that can be found, right? And of course, in in very humid environment, then your uh, your ability to cool down yourself by sweating is is not very well either, and that is really the main reason for the troubles with uh, high humidity. But but even the feeling of thick air in your lung, you feel that, and you feel like you want to breathe heavier, and um, and that's uh, and that's just because of uh, oxygen not being as much of a concentration as it should okay so that is in the atmosphere in the alveoli on the other hand you will see things have changed a little bit except for the nitrogen which is insignificant for us at the point because there is nitrogen doesn't dissolve very very well in water to begin with and the only time it dissolves in the plasma and the blood is if it's under excessive pressure, like uh, for the divers, for example, if they go into uh, deep, deep uh, uh, sea, and uh, they their tanks on their back has a mixture of uh, gases, and the nitrogen, which generally wouldn't dissolve in the plasma, now starts to dissolve because you're under higher pressure, and if they dis if they ascend quickly to the surface we all know what happens that the nitrogen that was dissolved now start to form bubbles because it's insoluble and that of course can result in embolism and that's why they teach divers when they ascend that they ascend slowly uh, to avoid this kind of syndrome from happening okay so that's for the nitrogen and that's the only important aspect of the nitrogen however oxygen you will see that there is a big drop, and the big drop is attributed to many things. The first, the first thing, which is not the main reason, you will see that water here, which used to be only half a percentage, then it rose by 10, per, 10 times, tenfolds, more than tenfolds. So it became 47%, right? And that occupied some of the air, so it thinned the concentration of oxygen but that's not really the main reason i'll tell you the main reason in in just a little bit but let's also have a look first at the carbon dioxide carbon dioxide which the percentage was very insignificant then inside your alveoli inside your lungs not the trachea not the bronchus inside the alveoli the concentration becomes five percent and therefore the partial pressure for carbon dioxide in the alveolar air became 40 millimeter mercury now so the reason for this very strong increase i mean the water it's easy to explain and it's because of evaporation of water from the surfaces of the lung the the alveoli are covered with watery surface and evaporation of that will result in the increase of um, the percentage of water in the air in the alveoli and therefore the increase in the partial pressure of water inside the alveoli that's understood but if you look at these numbers it doesn't make sense because now they increased with much more percentage i mean for here for example carbon dioxide increased a hundred fold and so the reason for that is the fact if you remember from the respiratory volumes after the tidal respiration after the tidal volume there's still a lot of air remaining inside your lung you remember there is expiratory reserve volume and then there is um then there, there is uh, your um, residual volume after that so those two are a lot in comparison to the tidal volume tidal volume you're breathing in is not really that much in comparison to the existing air right what that tells you is that the fresh air coming to your alveoli is going to be mixed with old air right so fresh air coming in mixing with the alveoli and giving you always a semi-constant semi-constant concentration of gases inside your alveoli and you will say to yourself, well, that is ridiculous. Why would I just replenish my um, 
my oxygen, the ones that I take into the blood, why can't I just exchange everything and get fresher air? Well, then you will have fluctuations in the loading of your oxygen, and you don't want to do that. You don't want to have fluctuations in the amount of oxygen and the carbon dioxide loaded and unloaded inside your lung uh, based on whether you are taking a deep breath or not. You would like the exchange of gases to happen whether you are taking an inspiration or you're giving an expiration. You would like the concentration to remain the same. You would like the partial pressure of oxygen inside your alveoli to remain the same. And so therefore, the blood, the blood doesn't stop when you're breathing or when you're not breathing. The blood continues, the capillary flow continues to happen. So as you are breathing and as you are replenishing the amount, the air, the concentrations of gases in your lungs and just fix it back into these levels that you see here on the right, as you are doing that, the capillary flow continues to happen and therefore you're ensuring that the exchange of gases, the exchange of gases inside your alveoli, between the alveoli and the capillaries, the exchange doesn't happen in the alveoli, but between the alveoli and the capillaries will continue regardless whether you are in inspiration or expiration or in between them. You get that? And that's thanks to the amount of air that you took in, which is the tidal volume, and you mixed with the existing air, which is the sum of the residual volume and the expiratory reserve volume. Sounds good? Good. That will be very important later on, especially when we talk about the dead space. Okay? What is the dead space? We'll mention that in just a short bit. Okay. So we get the point, the changes here we see in the partial pressure for oxygen and the partial pressure for carbon dioxide is mainly due to the fact that the air you're breathing in will mix with the existing air and that will change the concentrations slightly from 160 to 104 from 0.3 percent it will go up 100 times that's not slightly it's not a slight change it is a significant very significant change for the carbon dioxide but keep an eye on that because we're going to need those numbers later on when it comes to the exchange of gases okay so for the exchange of gases, I'm going to skip this slide. I'm going to back, come, come back to it. There are, as I said earlier, there is exter external exchange that happens here, external respiration, and then the internal one that happens here. So let's talk about this external exchange. We agreed earlier that the partial pressure of oxygen inside the alveoli is approximately 100, 104, right? We agreed also that the partial pressure for carbon dioxide is approximately 40. If you compare that with the atmospheric air, we said earlier that the atmospheric air has much higher oxygen percentage and much lower carbon dioxide percentage. But the fact that the fresh air is mixing with the old air and the fact that water now plays more role inside your lungs will change the partial pressure for oxygen and will change the partial pressure for carbon dioxide to be 104, 105, and for the carbon dioxide to be 40. Sounds good? So that is when it comes to the alveoli and the atmospheric air, right? So, but what about the venous blood, the deoxygenated blood that's coming, if you remember, from the aortic, from the pulmonary artery, uh, through the pulmonary valve, pulmonary artery, and it will go to be oxygenated in those capillaries around the alveoli. So the partial pressure for oxygen in those cases is approximately 40 and the partial pressure for carbon dioxide is 46. Okay, so diffusion will happen. Higher percentage, higher partial pressure for carbon dioxide will go outside because in the alveoli, we know that the partial pressure is 40, right? So carbon dioxide would rather go outside. To the, and the opposite is true for oxygen. Now, partial pressure for oxygen is 40 inside, and the partial pressure for oxygen inside the alveoli is about 100, 105, and therefore oxygen will diffuse to inside across what we call the respiratory membrane, which is formed by type 1 alveolar cells, interstitial tissue, 
and the endothelial lining of your capillaries and now the exchange took place there's an important thing here to keep an eye on you will see that the partial pressure gradient for oxygen is much much higher than the partial pressure gradient for carbon dioxide what does that mean well it means here 160 minus 100 is 60 right so the partial pressure gradient here is 60 whereas the partial pressure gradient for carbon dioxide is only 6 right 46 minus 4 minus 40 is 6 does that mean carbon dioxide will diffuse much slower than oxygen if you remember fixed law diffusion of substances or will always depend on the concentration gradient and in this case the um, the pressure gradient well it doesn't and the reason for that is that carbon dioxide dissolves much easier and it has what we call diffusion coefficiency much more than oxygen and therefore even though the pressure gradient for oxygen is much higher than the pressure gradient for carbon dioxide carbon dioxide dissolves much faster anyways and that evens up the game so both of them dissolve almost or not dissolve they diffuse almost at the same velocity at the same speed and that allows the loading and unload the loading of oxygen and the unloading of carbon dioxide to happen at the same kinetic speed that's very important fact because if you imagine otherwise you're loading with oxygen great oxygen came in but the capillary flow continues to go right and before you know it before you can get rid of the carbon dioxide because the, the the pressure gradient is not that high then the blood already has gone right the capillary from the capillary area and you lost your chances right so it makes perfect sense that the 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 speed is the same between them and the reason is even though the partial pressure here for oxygen is higher the partial pressure gradient is higher or the pressure gradient is higher for oxygen uh than carbon dioxide the 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 carbon dioxide has more partition coefficient it can dissolve it can diffuse faster much faster than oxygen and therefore the speed of the exchange happen evenly either for oxygen or carbon dioxide we get that so as the capillaries are exiting the blood uh, inside the capillaries as the capillaries are exiting that alveolar area you will realize that the partial pressure in the arteriolar blood now became approximately 100 105 because the oxygen moved from the higher gradient to the lower gradient and the partial pressure for carbon dioxide uh, went down from 46 to 40 that's your arterial we always think that uh, all the carbon dioxide will be lost at uh, this exchange no it doesn't only a small percentage of the carbon dioxide matter of fact you absolutely need your carbon dioxide that is your main stimulant for breathing you can't get rid of too much carbon dioxide you need that besides the carbon dioxide maintains your ph and we'll talk about that later on when we get to the bicarbonate and later on when we get to the regulation of your ph you'll realize you can't get rid of too much carbon dioxide matter of fact if someone forces himself to breathe heavier so he's conducting hyperventilation intentional hyperventilation then you're getting rid of too much carbon dioxide and that can push your blood ph into alkaline and we call that respiratory alkalosis it's alkalosis that is caused by excessive respiration alkalosis meaning your blood ph became alkaline became basic why because you got rid of too much carbon dioxide you can't allow that get it so just keep an eye on this and remember the fact that you don't really get rid of all the carbon dioxide you still are holding to lots of carbon dioxide arterial blood goes back to the left atrium left atrium left ventricle and from the left ventricle to the aorta it gets to the arteries arterioles and to the capillaries 
and inside the capillaries there will be another exchange but it's an exchange that is based on the need of the tissue right so in this exchange the the gases uh, again will go according to their um, pressure gradient so inside the tissue if the tissue is metabolically active it is producing a lot of carbon dioxide right the cells are producing lots of carbon dioxide and they're consuming oxygen so inside the cells the partial pressure of oxygen will be lower than 40 and the partial pressure for carbon dioxide will be more than 46 that will allow the carbon dioxide to go to the interstitial space and from the interstitial space it's going to be exchanged with the blood and therefore carbon dioxide will get to the blood and we will see how it's carried and the oxygen will be unloaded first to the interstitial space and from the interstitial, interstitial space it will be uh, diffused through the cell membrane of the cells to be participating in the oxidative respiration sounds good so i unloaded oxygen and we will realize in a little bit that there are rules that guide this kind of loading and unloading of oxygen there are rules that couple the oxygen with the carbon dioxide so the more you load carbon dioxide the more you unload oxygen when you pick up carbon dioxide by the blood you will realize the blood is happy to give up oxygen conversely here when we pick up oxygen the blood is happy to give carbon dioxide there are two very important rules here that guide the exchange of gases also here when you pick up hydrogen ions you will give up oxygen because when you pick up hydrogen ions that mean that that means the tissue is metabolically active if the tissue is metabolically active then it needs oxygen because it means here we are doing a lot of glycolysis and we don't have enough oxygen to form the water so please give up oxygen and you will see how the unloading of oxygen takes place so the capillary blood the arterial blood came into the tissue as uh, 100 partial pressure for oxygen 100 105 and the partial pressure for carbon dioxide came in as 40 but they exited again at 46 for carbon dioxide and 40 for oxygen i lost oxygen and i loaded carbon dioxide great how long does this take place for this exchange to happen instantaneously in less than a quarter of a second this exchange will happen so if we look here this is in seconds in a quarter of a second here is the start of the capillary the blood is coming with partial pressure of oxygen approximately 40 within a quarter of a second then it is already loaded right so it gives you a chance, a second chance in between the, sec the first quarter and the second quarter of a second because the capillary blood is still there, right? The blood did not exit the capillary. The blood will exit the capillary here, right? After 0.7 seconds. So if the exchange is incomplete for some reason, you have more exposure between the air and the capillary. It's not direct exposure. Of course, it's indirect exposure between the two contact almost contact not direct contact again between the two and that allows more chances for oxygen and carbon dioxide to diffuse across the respiratory membrane makes sense okay great so if we go back to a slide that i skipped uh, we did talk about the partial pressure and in equilibrium similar to the, the the diffusion at equilibrium then the two at uh, the two sides will be equal sort of like what we saw here that once an equilibrium happen then partial pressure for carbon dioxide here is 40 here is 40 partial pressure here for oxygen here is 100 here is 100 and that is equilibrium right okay great so we did talk about those things and um these numbers you don't have to really worry about it but I, I just want you to realize here that nitrogen doesn't really dissolve in water but under higher pressure as we agreed earlier nitrogen will indeed dissolve and like i said in divers uh, your nitrogen will dissolve in the water but the minute they start ascending unless they ascend slowly if they ascend suddenly then there will be bubble formation because the dissolved nitrogen 
will form bubbles and that is very dangerous because it can result in embolism what we call air embolism okay all right so how do i improve the exchange if i increase the surface area and matter of fact if the, the surface area and the capillaries and the alveoli can fill almost a tennis court if you line them side by side and the, whereas inside your lung it's fairly small area but it's because of the convolution of those spaces and the amount of capillaries and the surface that is available for the exchange of gases. In case of edema, pulmonary edema, if anything happened in the interstitial space uh, then the diffusion will not happen because the respiratory or it will happen at a slower pace because the respiratory membrane got thicker right and therefore it will take longer time for the gases to be exchanged any increase in the thickness in this barrier that separates the two will result in the fact that the exchange of gases will be hindered right the diffusion coefficient, and I, I mentioned it before when I told you that the diffusion coefficient for um, carbon dioxide is much higher than oxygen, which was great because the pressure gradient for oxygen was higher than carbon dioxide. So the diffusion coefficient for carbon dioxide will make up for the fact that it doesn't have that much of a gradient difference, and the exchange will happen at an equal speed to that of the oxygen. Make sense? Okay, so keep that in mind, please. All right, I'm gonna skip this one. And we go to this slide here, which explains pretty much what I described to you in the graph, that inside the air, in the air, you have 160 and 0.3. When you get to the alveolar air, the alveolar space, you have 105 for 100 for oxygen, partial pressure and you have 40 for the partial pressure of carbon dioxide that will allow the exchange of gases to happen at the alveolar level between the capillaries and the alveoli and conversely also at the tissue level you will have the higher carbon dioxide diffusing to the blood from the tissues and the higher oxygen diffusing from the from the blood to the tissues make sense excellent okay so that brings us to the dead volume and I kind of talked to you about it earlier and if, if you think of all your respiratory tract and your respiratory system you will realize that the exchange of gases only happens at the very very terminal end which is your alveolar space and the respiratory bronchioles but most of the passage there is no exchange there is no exchange that happen in your pharynx in your nose there is no exchange happening there there is no exchange that happens in the trachea no exchange takes place in the bronchus at least not significant exchange happening in the bronchus or the bronchial branches or even the bronchioles if they are not respiratory bronchioles okay so all of this is what we call anatomical dead space anatomical dead space which will be very important because when you're breathing when you're taking if you remember the tidal volume was approximately 500 uh, milliliter uh, your dead space is approximately 150 that means what is entering to your alveoli is approximately 350 milliliter not 500 you lost about 150 because that 150 stayed in the anatomical dead space we're going to talk in a lecture about the anatomical dead space but just keep in mind that not all the air you're breathing is getting into the alveoli right some of the air will stay behind in the trachea right and will stay behind in the bronchial branches and the bronchioles and it's not going to reach the alveolar space where the exchange happens again we call that anatomical dead space we're good good there's another form of dead space which is called alveolar dead space so it's a space inside the alveoli but yet there is no exchange of gases and some of you are saying are you crazy you know this how can that happen it's inside the alveoli of course there will be exchange of gases you're right 
In normal physiological situations, when the alveoli are small, like here, here are alveoli, the distance from between the gases which are present here to the capillaries which are present here in the alveolar walls is not that big so it will allow the exchange of gases so even though the gases are here in the center i mean if they are very close here to the wall the exchange will have without problem but even if it's far enough like somewhere here in the center this is easy to for the gases to move around and therefore the diffusion more or less happens evenly and there isn't much of what we can call dead alveolar space right remember the dead anatomical space this is dead alveolar space well in cases of emphysema what happens is the person because of repeated inflammation and then there will be much less what we call antitrypsin the lungs are supposed to secrete trypsin and antitrypsin and if the trypsin which digests protein is unopposed uh, then it will start to chew off these walls in addition to the increased pressure that's happening here. So the inflammation and the increased pressure together will result in the fact that the alveoli will fuse together and they will form what is shaped here like a major or a super alveolus. See how big is the alveolus here compared to a normal size alveolus, right? But now because of these alveoli in COPD and emphysema, became so big now the expanded alveoli will have what we can call alveolar dead space so the dead space now is not only limited to the anatomical dead space but also inside the alveoli you have another dead space because the the gases here in the center are not going to exchange with the blood capillaries which are all the way around here so in those cases of emphysema the the patient's lungs are 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 full of air but the exchange doesn't happen because it doesn't happen evenly at least because of the destruction of the alveolar walls and because of the increase of what we call alveolar dead space that's a very important thing to keep an eye on so now we understand that there is uh, uh, an anatomical dead space and there is also a an alveolar dead space but the alveolar dead space in normal conditions is insignificant but in pathological situations then it becomes highly significant okay so i'm gonna stop here and that part will be and then the remaining part will be in part two uh, of the exchange of gas lecture but i wanted you to appreciate what happens um, here and the fact that we have partial pressure of gases in mixture of gases what happens uh, when the air moves from the atmosphere to the alveoli the changes in uh, the the pressure and the fact that the percentage of oxygen um, if it stays at 20 percent and if you drop the pressure or the, the overall atmospheric pressure if it drops then that means the partial pressure of oxygen became reduced even though even though the percentage of oxygen oxygen is the same but because of the the overall pressure is reduced and i gave you examples of the milk and you know the overall weight of your grocery and the percentage of the milk we gave all these examples we talked about the exchange of gases that happen and the rule fixed law which we studied in the second chapter or third chapter of our uh, physiology uh, now it becomes very important again to revisit that and we understand that it's not the concentration we don't call it concentration but it's the pressure gradient of the gases that is very critical for the exchange and we will see later on in the lectures what can happen what can go wrong and if the pressure gradient is affected and uh, we ended up by talking about the dead space initially we talked about the anatomical dead space and then we ended with the uh, alveolar dead space and so the in the second part we will talk about the mechanics 
of the exchange or the kinetics of the exchange. We will understand about the oxygen loading and the oxygen dissociation. We will talk about the Haldane effect and the Bohr effect. All of these are very, very, very important terms to remember. So keep an eye, please, and please watch the second part of, um, of this online lecture uh, for understanding more uh, the gas diffusion and the rules that guide the gas diffusion. All right. Have a great day.